All right. Welcome, my friends, to the next episode here, the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A here on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel, X, Facebook, Instagram, all those great places where we are helping you break free of the diet and exercise rat race through a fundamental approach to fitness. My name is Matt Shifley, as always, and today we're talking about the top body weight based exercises for helping you build strong legs and more importantly why just raw strength in the muscles is not enough for you to get the type of performance and aesthetic augmentation aka the muscle and shape that you want out of your legs we're going to be looking at common mistakes that people make when it comes to leg training especially body weight leg training that often holds people back and what you can do to make your leg training more effective, more efficient, and a heck of a lot safer. Uh, I'll also be answering your questions as always on the Q&A, and I'll be referring to all the resources that help sponsor today's episode, which is the litany of stuff over at reddeltaproject.com. I put the link down below. That's for all of my books, my quick reads, including my new adaptive training strategies, and for my coaching programs, my in-person coaching here in Denver, Colorado, remote coaching through Fortify and micro coaching for those who just want something quick and simple for me to check in. If you want me to look at your program or technique or something, micro coaching is a very cost efficient and time efficient way to go about doing that. So let's jump right in. I know that I'm a little bit, uh, the uh, uh, timing is off on this because I'm recording this on a Sunday. I usually do my live streams on Saturday, but I was involved working at a Taekwondo tournament all day yesterday, and uh, I was hoping to get out in time to be able to do the usual time, but uh, alas, it did not happen. So apologies to those out there who were not able to jump into the usual program, uh, but I promise it will be back on the regular schedule next week. So leg training, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about everything from the lower body, working the quads, the glutes, the hamstrings, the calves and stuff. And when it comes to body weight training in particular, as we were discussing in our episode last week, lots of times people will be like, oh yeah, calisthenics is great for the upper body. You got dips, you got pull-ups, you got one arm uh, stuff like one arm push-ups and stuff. And then when people are like, well, what about legs? And people are like, mm, yeah, legs, not so much. But I've long believed that some of the best ways for developing your lower body are calisthenics or calisthenics-based exercises. And the reason for this is simple, is because as with everything with our body, it takes more than just strength of a muscle. If it just took strength and just jump on a weight machine or even do isometrics, contract the mother living hell out of your muscles, and boom, your muscles or your uh, legs would be perfectly conditioned and strong as they'd ever need to be for you to do everything you want with it. Case closed, no problems, no issues whatsoever. But of course, that's not what often ends up happening. What usually ends up happening when it comes to trying to develop the lower body is people find that they're getting held back. And the great mistake is believing that they're being held back by the modality that they're training, that it's calisthenics that are holding them back or a particular machine or a free weight based or something that is holding them back. But the fact of the matter is that the ability for you to get the results that you want in developing the muscle and strength depends much more on you and what you bring to the modality rather than what the modality brings to you. In other words, <laughs> you know, if you're not getting good results, it's your fault. And that's the thing that I wish I knew back in the day, because I was always trying to figure out what's the best modality for building muscle and strength with anything. What's the best modality for building chest, for building up the back and the biceps, which we'll be covering in future episodes here in the next couple of weeks. What's the best modality? Is it free weights or machines or whatever for developing strong legs, and especially being a bike racer and uh, avid skier and stuff, I was always concerned with how can I really build up my legs. And funny enough, the thing that drastically improved things, by far better results was definitely calisthenics based. And it wasn't because of the calisthenics nature of simplicity and efficiency. But as I always tell new clients, whenever I'm meeting with them, I always say, beware, uh, warned that a lot of people don't like progressive calisthenics because it exposes imbalances and weaknesses 
that often hold you back. And this is nowhere more prevalent and true than in the world of lower body training. Because a lot of us, when it comes to the proficiency that we use our muscles with, the lower body is usually pretty uh, low on the totem pole. Most of us have pretty poor hip uh, muscle activation, especially in our hips and our hamstrings. Most people out there have pretty poor mobility, especially in their hips and uh, their ankles. Most of us have pretty poor stability, again, with the hips and the lower body. And in the holistic nature, the fundamental nature of strength training, when we want to make our muscles bigger and stronger and the ability to challenge our work capacity, we also must have a decent level of engagement, a decent level of proficiency in stability and mobility. And because most of us have somewhere along the lines, some sort of hang up in that area with our lower body, we find that the ability to adequately train our muscles through body weight training is inadequate. But it's not because there's not enough resistance with the lower body. It's because we lack in those other areas. So as a result, things that are commonplace in the body weight world, like pistol squats, for example, often are much more about stability training versus strength training or work capacity, aka hypertrophy training, or that we're working on a limit of our uh, mobility and range of motion. If we're doing lateral squats and we can't get our hips all the way down, well, there's oftentimes a mobility challenge that's going to hold you back. And this is why most people are going to be far better off training their lower body on, forget even free weights, weight machines, just straight up weight machines, get on a hack squat machine or a leg press and stuff. Why? Because these machines require very little stability and mobility. And yet you can just load it up with a God awful amount of weight, therefore having a good amount of resistance to adequately challenge your lower body. And that I'm not criticizing anything. I'm not saying anything of what you should and shouldn't do. I'm just stating that because most of us are woefully lacking in engagement, stability, and mobility, we're going to be much safer and much better off using weight machines, not even free weights, but machines for our lower body. If you just came to me and you're like, I just want to get bigger, stronger legs. I don't care about anything else. Head to the weight machines, not even free weights. And that's simply because it takes those things out. But that may not be always in the cards. You may not have access to such machines. You may not enjoy using such machines. For some reason, I'm not sure why, I've always felt like I could barely get what I wanted out of leg presses. Every time I was using a leg press, my legs were just eh, like I barely felt it in my quads. I'm not sure why again, but leg presses always left me feeling kind of, I guess I work my legs, I think, I suppose. Versus a lot of calisthenic stuff, it's like, holy smokes, my quads are absolutely on fire. And that's a very important thing that we want to be paying attention to. Because how an exercise feels is a very strong correlative factor in how effective the exercise is. If you have trouble feeling a muscle working adequately in an exercise, chances are it's not very much of an adequate exercise for you. So that's why... Leading into today's conversation, I want you to just simply be aware that it's not the modality that you use. It's not about free weights versus machines versus calisthenics and stuff. It's instead, what is the easiest way for you to adequately challenge and work the muscles and the muscular work capacity of your lower body? And again, for most people, that's going to be flat out machines. Take as little skill out of the movement as possible or even isometrics use like an ISO max or an ISO chain. And that's going to be by far the easiest way for a lot of people to challenge their lower body. So before continuing on, let me get to some questions here. Good to see some folks popping now and in. Cristobal saying, hey, Matt, good to see you again. Thanks. Talking about calisthenics leg exercises. How much carryover do you think pistol slash swim squats to barbell movements like deadlift and regular squat? Uh, answer there is a ton, a, a lot. And the reason for it is because the movement pattern is so similar. Whenever we're talking about functional carryover, we want to be looking at how similar the demand or the specific demands of one exercise to the other are. Now, it's weird because 
there are lots of examples of people who do calisthenics for a while and then they lift weights and they're much stronger at the weights. There's also plenty of examples of people who do calisthenics for a while and they go to the weights and they're weaker. And again, it's not the modality. Calisthenics doesn't do anything for you. It's what you do with calisthenics that gets you results. So I know I'm a beating dead horse here, but the results you want depend far more on you than the modality. If you're lost in the city trying to get to where you want, the type of car you're driving isn't going to stop you from being lost. It's whether or not you know how to find your way. But if the movement patterns and the functional demand is very similar, chances are very good there's going to be a lot of carryover. Christopher is saying, hey, Matt, I used to do the wrestler's bridge. Now my neck bothers me, so I stopped doing them. Mm -hmm. What are your opinions on this exercise? Can you recommend a calisthenics exercise to train neck muscles? Well, first and foremost, one of the great things about calisthenics is it's one, it's, it's one of the most comprehensive ways to train your neck just by doing the exercises in general. And that's because calisthenics training changes our physical orientation to the pull of gravity many different ways. We're facing towards the floor, we're facing up from the floor, we're vertical, we're sideways, we're twisting, we're moving. We are inherently moving our body in its orientation to gravity constantly when it comes to calisthenics training. Comparatively with free weights or with machines, most of the time we're either upright, like we are all the time anyway, or if we're even laying down or something, then our head is resting on some sort of a pad so the neck isn't getting any training. So inherently, most people find that just normal calisthenics practice on its own is plenty fine for adequately training the neck. If you're a football player, a race car driver, or a wrestler in particular, it may need a little bit more, but most people will find that just normal calisthenics training with the way that you orient your head in different angles to gravity is gonna be more than enough. I get compliments on my neck uh, aesthetics from time to time. And I don't do anything for my neck because my neck is always working the front sides, the back and stuff just through the natural course of regular calisthenics exercises. And when I'm doing body weight rows, you know, my front of my neck is working to pull my neck up kind of thing. So you may not need any direct ne neck training whatsoever. The other thing too, though, is if you do want it, I made a video on this. If you just tr Google the neck training or neck exercise on my site, I just do isometric neck uh, holds where my head is on a weight bench. So it's a bridge, but you're not placing pressure directly against your neck, uh, you know, the, the vertebrae in your neck or the spine. Uh, I do it isometrically if you are going to do it. And you can do the front side and back that way. Much safer because I got a lot of questions. Jeff Cavalier put out a video years ago where he's criticizing the wrestler's bridge. And people were asking me left and right, like, what would you do? What would you do? I was like, fine, I'll make this video for what I would do. And that's a good exercise to replace it much. And I, I think it also puts a lot more resistance against the neck too. It's a lot easier to progress and uh, work the neck a lot harder. And that's kind of one of the things that you want to always keep in mind talking about leg training, but also just the body in general is whatever's going to make it easier for you to push your muscles harder is going to be a more effective approach for you. So if you're doing a leg exercise or a neck exercise or what have you, and you're like, boy, this is really hard for me to do the exercise because of the skill component or the stability or the mobility component or whatever, it's hard for me to adequately challenge my muscles because these other things are a limited, a rate limiting step, then it's going to be harder for you to build up that muscle and strength the way you want it. So the whole strategy that you want to impart with lower body training and just in general is use easy techniques, use exercises that require as little skill as possible, or at least a lower level of skill. So that skill isn't the limiting fact, that your mobility isn't your limiting thing, that your stability isn't the limiting thing. And I'll be giving you strategies on how to do that for the lower body here in a second. But if you're doing an exercise and you're like, ah, oh, it's uncomfortable, it's really weird on my neck, it's kind of, then it's not a good exercise for you. You want something that is more comfortable, easier to do, and a lot easier to adjust. Therefore, you're going to be able to have much more success and you're going to maintain it a lot more as well. Ryan K is saying, 
excuse me, folks, grab my tea. Still a little behind under the weather these days. But uh, Ryan's saying, hey, Matt, you're so right about when calisthenics exposing imbalances. Yes, I used to avoid it. Now I'm leaning into it. Smart man. Seeing gains. Knee pain going away. Able to run and sprint again. Knees over toes and isos for the win. Fantastic. Good job, man. Good job. I love that. And I'm sure I'm going to get questions on this. Like, what do you think of the knees over toes guy? For some, Honestly, I, I don't follow him. I don't follow many people. Uh, I'm always just doing my own thing. But yeah, it's like, of course, knees are supposed to go over toes. You know, when people are like, what are our knees supposed to go over toes? Our knees over to like, well, yeah, your knees are supposed to bend forward. If they're going backwards, you got bigger problems. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. I apologize, folks. I don't know why my camera is not doing so well right now. I got this flashing going on. Hopefully I can minimize that. Maybe it's a lighting thing. I tell you, the lighting in my apartment here is like the worst for making videos. So I'm trying to get those things taken care of. Uh, Fatih Merge is saying, Matt, uh, good days. Uh, what are your opinion on pistol squat versus a shrimp squat? I am almost always giving people something with a range of motion limitation these days. Uh, box pistol squats. So we'll jump right into it. What are some of the best uh, single leg squat variations? Shrimp squats. Um, some people call them skater squats or I call them hover lunges. Basically, if you think of a shrimp squat, where you're not holding your leg behind you, you're just kind of keeping your foot up off the floor. That's a hover lunge. That's usually a, a level that I give people all the time and something that limits the range of motion because many people really struggle to adequately engage the muscles and have the mobility to squat that deep in a pistol squat. So the, the litmus test I give people is a shifting squat that I have in all of my, my grind style calisthenics programs and a lot of other things that I do. Uh, it's, can you squat and practically put your butt on your heels uh, or within about five or six inches? If you struggle to get that deep, you have no business doing pistol squats, in my opinion, because you just don't have the hip mobility to go that low, to go that deep. And I wish I knew that back in the day myself, because I used to try to force myself through pistol squats, forcing the square peg into the round hole. And uh, I could do it. Yes. You know, a lot of times we're doing an exercise and you're like, I've got a pistol squat. I can do it. I can do it. That still doesn't mean it's an adequate exercise for you. It's not about can you do it? It's can you control it? Do you have proficiency with it? Or are you bouncing out of the bottom position? Are you coming down and like releasing the tension in those last couple of inches and then you're like all oh, struggling with your arms and you're doing the Jack Sparrow thing where you're like reaching forwards and stuff to get out of the hole in the pistol squat. That's usually a sign that you don't have the strength and control to adequately and safely handle that depth of range of motion. And for that reason, I very often do not uh, give people pistol squats, the full pistol, but box pistols, shrimp squats, hover lunges, uh, where the knee is, a lit is uh, holding them down where they're having that range of motion limitation to it. And that gives them more of a range of control as opposed to what range of motion you're trying to get. Zen1985 saying, <coughs> excuse me, uh, wrong pipe. <clears throat> Overcoming isometric only in bottom position in squat for max leg strength. Uh, what do you think? Which angle do you prefer for max strength? All of them. You know, don't think of it because when a muscle contracts, it does not really matter what angle you're at. Now, for me personally, I've always enjoyed training done, quote, the hard way. When I coach folks over at Capra in progressive calisthenics, I always, again, warn them. I'm like, I'm going to warn you. We do things the hard way here. You know, you think you can do 50 push-ups. By the time we're done, you might get 10. You, know, you think you can do a pistol squat. You're going to be challenging yourself with just simple bodyweight lunges because we do things the hard way. Same thing with isometrics. I like getting really nice and deep with the isometric holds and stuff that I'm doing. Why? Because it's just harder. When you make things mechanically more disadvantageous in your training, you're just making it easier to create the stimulus that you want. So it's easier because it's harder or it's harder because it's easier and therefore easier for the harder or 
Okay, I'm getting confused now, but you know what I'm saying. But that doesn't mean that there's no value in going to a higher level. You could go to a higher level and find, oh, I can get more engagement in my glutes up here or my calves. Or you might go a little bit higher and be like, there's less stress in my lower back, so now I can contract my muscles harder. So there's no one best or optimal angle for these things. But with isometrics, you're typically going to find that there's one or two angles that are like your bread and butter angles that you do it most of the time there. And then you can explore other angles just as a way to you know, think of how does it work for you. But the way to think about it, again, is how does it feel? Do you have a lot of engagement in the muscle? Is the muscle going crazy? And is there less strain, stress in uh, the tendons and stuff, in the, the knees, the ankles, the lower back and stuff? We want it to be as comfortable and in control as possible. Steve Calamar is saying, hey, Matt, appreciate all the knowledge you share. Thank you very much. Any thoughts on using pistol squats less with hypertrophy in mind, but more for mobility assessment? Yes, uh, plugging it in on mobility days, one or two uh, pause reps. Absolutely. Yeah, this is very good. So one of the things that I would recommend if you're using it as a mobility assessment, and this is point number two of today's episode, is don't be afraid, folks, to use upper body assistance especially when you're using big ranges of motion or using a, a pretty decent amount of resistance with these things. So holding on to things like the bars here on my dash from wildgym.com, right? My buddy, Dan Vincent up in Boulder. This thing is great for that. Holding on to rings or suspension straps or even something like, a, you know, some of my books I talk about doing pistol squats in doorways, holding on to a doorway as a little bit of assistance. Basically, when we have our upper body taking on some of the role of the stability and the control, we can work on that mobility and the ability to control and tense up the muscles in those deeper ranges of motion without worrying too much about the balance and the stability aspect of, oh, I can barely hold it and so, so on. So I recommend if you're using pistols as a mobility assessment, use a little bit of that upper body assistance. And not only can you get fairly deep with that, you may get deeper, but you can also probably get down and kind of just, you know, shift your weight around a little bit, get your knee more forward, get it back a little bit, side to side, a little bit of tipping and twisting with the hips, explore your ranges of motion in the bottom of a pistol and having your upper body assisted when you're holding on to something will allow that to happen and therefore create a stronger stimulus for your mobility. Cristobal following up saying, Matt, I'm dealing with pain my right lat every time I do pull-ups. Following a power lifter lifting program, I do the deadlift two times a week. Yep, fairly classic. And also do pull-ups and rows two times. What do you think this could be? You probably just have a simple muscle strain somewhere, man. It's probably just a simple injury and you need to give it some rest. It could be that simple you know, where you've got a, a tweak, a strain, uh, something just went pop in the night and it could have just been one single rep that you did and now you're just not letting it heal. So if I were you, I would look at what those exercises you're doing, which ones are seeming to engage the lat or cause more pain and focus on just whichever one is not doing it. Maybe it's the rows, maybe it's maybe it's a deadlift, maybe you swap the deadlift out for a carry, uh, but basically work around the injury, but don't do things that hurt and it may take a few weeks for it to just heal back up and then you work it back up to the, the weight or the loads that you're using and uh, then you're right as rain. But I'm, I'm willing to bet you just tweaked it, you injured it, and now you just need to let it heal. <clears throat> Frankus saying, what do you think of Bruce Lee's workouts? His legs were a bit thin though. His whole body was thin. Dude, he weighed 135 pounds. Bruce Lee did not train for mass. In fact, when he started to explore the idea of utilizing physical conditioning for improving his martial arts, which at the time was a radical idea, uh, he started to put on some muscle because he was there in you know, Oakland, California. And he's like, all right, I want to condition my body better beyond what I'm getting from my martial arts. Uh, how do I do that? And of course, at that time, if you asked anybody who knew anything about strength training, chances were very good. You were getting influences and information from bodybuilders. So if you look at some of his earlier programs and stuff in the book that was written by John Tuttle, Discover, um, Expressing the Human Body, he did a lot of straight up bodybuilding work for a while. 
and he started to get bigger, but he found that it wasn't quite as conducive to what he wanted for his martial arts training. So then he started to work much more with like the isometric training and things of that nature. So that's the thing is if you look at some of the stuff that he did, his workouts were always evolving. It would be impossible to ever look at a snapshot of some of his workout logs, which are in that book, Expressing the Human Body. And he's like, okay, that's what the Bruce Lee workout was. That's what he was doing. It's like, you could look at his workouts every single day for the next, you know, for the year that he was doing it. It's like, it's different most of the time because it was always changing and always evolving. And second is, it's really hard to judge a workout based on the appearance of somebody because yes, a workout and what someone's doing is a very strong influence over someone's shape and size and stuff. But there are so many other variables that also go into how big someone can be and how big someone is prone to become that they could have, for all we know, the ultimate mass building leg workout and still have skinny legs because other factors are just not in alignment for that. So there's always a lot of variables involved in how someone's physical shape takes place from training and diet and exercise. It's, it's short-sighted to say, oh, they did this workout. That's why their legs look like that. And that that's not how the fitness works. Nelly, good to see you. What do you think about leg curls for the hamstrings while hanging down from a pull-up bar? Oh, that's interesting. What are you doing to load it? Are you using any of the anchor or the ankle uh, weights over at kensui.com? That could work well. Um, that might be good. I haven't used it. It seems to me a little bit rough. So let's, let's go into now. So we talked about compound movements, a uh, big fan of using less range, less stability. So that way you can really load up the legs. Okay? And if you need extra uh, external load to do that, go for it. Weight vests work particularly well for loading up these things, because when we have weight in hand, this is one of the things that's very telling about especially single leg stuff is you move your hands two inches forwards and things get a lot different for pistol squats. You know, I, back in the day, the first time I remember I had these, these chains that I had in my basement and I was like, I wonder what would happen. Like if I, if I took this 20 pound dumbbell, I was doing like pistol squats, a 20 pound dumbbell holding it in front of my chest like this. It's like, I wonder if I took one of these chains and just like draped it over my neck and tried to pistol squat. And I think one of those chains was something like seven pounds and it felt like an elephant was on my back because of the, the leverage that's going on it. So if you're going to load up some of these exercises with extra weight, I highly recommend a weight vest, uh, particularly the Kinsui weight vest, because less weight, it goes a long way for that sort of thing. And it also keeps you very honest. But anyway, we're talking about hamstring curls. So let's talk about individual exercises for parts of the muscles. So I've always been the bigger fan of just suspension hamstring curls, uh, foot suspended hamstring curls, you know, on suspension straps that particularly have foot loops like this and the NOSC trainers, you know, that in my humble opinion is the best hamstring curl exercise, bar none, period. Not with freight, not with uh, free weights, not weight machines and stuff. The foot suspended hamstring curl exercise is the best way to target your hamstrings as far as efficiency, simplicity. There's a lot of ways that you can regress it. There's a lot of ways you can progress it. It's really easy to load too. You just put a weight in your lap and it's really easy to start and stop the exercise too. You just lay down, put your feet in the slings, lift your hips up and you're ready to rock and roll. I got a ton of videos with tutorials on that on my site, but it also in, uh, integrates the use of your hamstrings with your hips and all of the muscles along your posterior chain as well, which is one of the reasons why I think it's fantastic. So when it comes to that hamstring curl, uh, my, my bet is hamstring curls on suspension straps. Every time, every day of the week, I will take that over anything else just because of its simplicity, efficiency, functional ability, carry over, all those things that I mentioned. Now for the front of the legs, same kind of deal. Uh, sissy squats for the quads. Sissy squats are monstrously effective and efficient for developing the quadriceps. 
for my legs in particular, like my legs were always, you know, they fairly decent size, but they never had any shape or tone in the quadriceps and never had any discernible like musculature in my quads, biker, skier, you know, barbell squats, didn't matter. Lunges, calisthenic, didn't matter. Once I started doing sissy squats though, on the regular basis, my quads changed relatively quickly. That's because it is the most and very practical and efficient way to directly train your quadriceps. They are brutal. And again, I got a ton of videos on uh, the uh, RDP YouTube channel. I should create a new blog post over at reddeltaproject.com on these things as well, but they are brutal on the quadriceps and they work your quads through the biggest range of motion of any other exercise you have as well, because you're both flexing your knee and extending your hip. And to my knowledge, I don't know of any other exercise that does that. Most everything is a flexion of the knee and the hip, but one of your quadricep muscles extend or uh, runs over your hip. So if you really want to work that muscle, uh, I think it's your rectus femoris, uh, then you want both your flexion of your knee and the extension of the hip and nothing beats the simple sissy squat at being able to do that. So hamstring curls on suspension straps, Towels on the floor also, as I cover in my book, Progressive and Weighted Calisthenics, that can be a close second. Sometimes you can find like an ab wheel or uh, some sort of roller system where you can put your feet in. That works pretty well as well. But the um, uh, that's for hamstrings. And then you've got uh, your sissy squats. Everything else, distant second, in my humble opinion. Ah. Uh. Ben Ben's asking about the Spanish squat. Honestly, never heard of it before. So I'll have to do some research. You know more about it than I do at this point. Nelly is saying, any good calisthenics exercise for the upper back rather than wide grip pull-up? Yes, anything that's working your back should be an upper back exercise there, Nelly. So every pull-up exercise is an upper back exercise. Every rowing exercise, upper back exercise. Anything where you are ever hanging from a bar in any capacity should be an upper body, upper back exercise. So front levers, skin the cat, hanging leg raises, uh, straight arm pull-ups, everything pulling is an upper back exercise. Uh, your rear flies on suspension straps, upper back exercise, bicep curls, upper back exercise. Remember, exercises don't work muscles. You use your muscles to do the exercise. So engage those muscles, engage your traps, engage your, your upper back with everything you're doing, and you'll be right as rain. Baldi de Gale saying, sorry, man, I, your hoodie was, uh, I thought that was hair for a second. I was like, that's not a really good, clever name, <laughs> but it is, it is very good. Baldi de Gale saying, did you build your body with calisthenics? No, I built it with a lot of things. I've built it with hiking, I've built it with skiing, I've built it with cycling, I've built it with food, I've built it with calisthenics, I've built it with weighted calisthenics, suspension calisthenics, powerlifting, bodybuilding, uh, hammer strength machines, cable machines. I've done a bunch of stuff all throughout time. And uh, yeah, sure, I've been doing primarily calisthenics for the past 15 years or so, but it would be remiss to say that my body is the result of just that. Our bodies are always the result of everything we've done throughout our entire life. So again, coming back to this mistake that we often make in our fitness culture of seeing someone do something and they have a given result and thinking they have that result because of what they're doing. Not at all true. Yes, what they're doing is part of it, but it's probably a much smaller part than we're giving it credit for. There's a lot of influences that as I talk about in my latest book, Be Fit, Live Free. Every result we have is due to many many, many, many influences. How much is calisthenics a result, uh, an influence on my current body? Eh, fairly decent. But would I say I have my body because of calisthenics? Absolutely not. There's thousands of variables, thousands of, the fact that I live here in Denver is a variable. But I wouldn't say, yeah, I've got these abs because I live here in Denver. But I wouldn't say it's not because I don't live in Denver. A lot of it has to do with lots of things. So am I working my muscles adequately with calisthenics? Absolutely. That's probably a better way to look at it. Just because I find it's a lot easier for me to work my muscles a heck of a lot harder with calisthenics than with anything else. 
<clears throat> Cristobal same, following up, same Matt. With dealing with pain in tendons and, and muscles, is it a good idea to replace dynamic heavy exercises for overcoming isometrics? I'm leading with pain and have a powerlifting meet in May. Well, yikes, dude. Yeah. Um, yeah, go with the isometrics for right now. But this is the part of the challenge with getting ready for things like meets and stuff is remember when you're getting ready for a big competition, you're essentially playing chicken with how much stress and the punishment your body can handle before it breaks. And if your body is breaking, then yeah, that just sucks. Uh, it's going to hold you back. Pain is always weakness. Pain will always hold you back. So isometrics would probably be a good way to go about it, but man, you've got to get over this and you got to get over it fast. But unfortunately the body heals on its own time. Uh, it sucks. I mean, I've known people who literally will train for years and uh, they're like, yeah, I've got this bodybuilding thing. I've got this competition and stuff. And they'll get injured two months before. And they're like, well, that's the end of that. No hope of that now. That sucks. I'm like, yeah, that happens. Like right now, you know, we got the Olympics, the Summer Olympics here in the United States uh, coming up in a couple of months. And right now, I guarantee you, there's someone who's out there and injured. And their dream of becoming an Olympic athlete is now shot to hell because they're hurt. And there's nothing they can do about it. They're hurt and it's going to compromise their training and it's going to compromise their performance and they're not going to make it. And there's just no two ways about it. So you got to get healthy real fast here, man. You got to get healthy. But unfortunately, that may be an outcome that you won't need to kind of consider is that this injury may prevent you from uh, doing your best in the powerlifting or even competing in it in general, depending on how bad it gets. Uh, that's why pain is just so, so insidious, but it's also part of being an athlete. When you're an athlete, you're basically playing chicken with how close you can get to breaking your body without uh, breaking it down too much. <clears throat> Nellie's asking, what's your standard for pull-ups and dip numbers in a row? Don't have any. I don't have such standards. It's just, what can you do? And then how do we improve on it? Because that's how you get stronger. I don't care if you know, if someone can do something or, or not, if you came to me and you're like, I can do 50 dips, I'd be like, great, but that's not going to make you stronger. Being able to do better dips, stronger dips is what's going to get you stronger. And again, I'm also very much about dropping numbers like crazy. To me, a big sign that you're headed in the right direction is when your numbers fall. I could do 20 pull-ups why the hell are you doing such easy pull-ups? Come on, let's get serious here. Let's do some real hardcore stuff. You know, if you can do more than five, too easy, too easy. Let's, let's go with some really hard stuff here. So yeah, that's why I'm not going to have a standard for you because you either meet the standard, which doesn't help you, or you're going to fall short of the standard, which doesn't help you. What does help you is how many can you do now? Good. And now how do we do it better? That's what gets you moving forward. Tala, it's good to see you. Matt, thanks, my respect. Thanks. Thank you for motivating my sissy squats. What happened is that I was, uh, was truing to hold uh, everything uh, pretty fair, but suddenly a shocking knee pain. What to work more? So look at your hips. Okay. Uh, make sure you're starting at the bottom. And again, like, folks, tweaks happen. You know, things just randomly occur. Uh, there was a a book I was reading by uh, the wrestler, you know, Triple H. And there was this one case where he had a severe strain in his quadricep. He was literally stepping in the ring, just stepping up on the step, put his foot down, and he sheared his quadricep to shreds, taking a step. It wasn't even an exercise. He just stepped and his quadricep was shredded to smithereens. And he had like an eight month recovery process from that. Injury and pain and things are just going to happen. Things like this, they just happen. And it seemingly comes out of the blue. You can do everything right. You can do everything safe. You can do everything perfectly fine. You're still going to have these times where you just do something and it just, ah, it just hits you. And you're going to have pain and you're going to have injury. It's just a part of what we do. And uh, the thing to do is you know, learn from it. Like, okay, what did I do wrong? If you can. And second, let it heal. Don't do things that hurt. Don't ignore it and stuff. And try to just 
learn for ways to not have it happen again. See what you did during that one time when you had that pain. Did you not have enough gluten hamstring activation? Did you not warm up? Did you just start off a little too aggressive with the resistance? Were you scrolling on your phone and not really paying attention when you did it? What did you do that possibly caused it? And there's always the re reality, the, the possibility that you didn't do anything. It was just, yep, a fluke thing. It hurt you. It injured you. You got six months of recovery and it's not going to happen again. Who the hell knows? <laughs> Maybe that's just the way it's going to work. Maybe that's just the way it's going to happen. So usually with sissy squats and knees, it's lack of activation in the quads, lack of range of tension in the quads, lack of activation in the glutes and the hamstrings. You could have had some lateral knee movement, which can sometimes happen. You could have just twisted or put a little bit more weight on one side versus the other. Try and learn from it. Try and see what you did that caused it. And if you didn't do anything, well, just let it heal and hope it doesn't happen again. <laughs> Nelly's asking, ab wheel rollout versus dragon flag. Which do you pick? Ab wheel rollout. I've gotten much more respect for the ab wheel rollout over the years, ever since Dan John, one of my mentors, talked about as being one of the best exercises you can do for your body, not just your abs, but just your body, period. Uh, and largely because it just connects things. It works things. It works on shoulder mobility and stability and works your lats. Again, if it's a back exercise, it should be working your upper back. So uh, back to our upper back conversation, that should also be an upper back exercise. Hip stability, core stability, breathing. Um, dragon flags, uh, very good. Uh, but uh, I'll take ab wheels for the win over those every time. So we got our quadriceps. We got our hamstrings. What about hips? Now, a lot of times the limiting factor for a lot of folks in their lower body is their hips. They don't have the strength, they don't have the stability, they don't have the mobility. And if your hips are weak in those three areas, everything else about your lower body is going to be handicapped. There's just no way around it other than utilizing some sort of techniques or equipment that allows you to work your legs hard without needing to have the stability, mobility, and strength in your hips, which is very often the case. So with the hips, you want to have very good activation of the hips, especially towards the bottom of a position uh, of the squat chain movements where your hips are getting closer to your heels. A lot of times people, they lose that. They start squatting down, lunging down, they're getting lower and lower and lower and their hips just turn right on off. They lose it in their glutes, they lose it in their lateral hip or they're in the thigh and stuff like that, which is why I'm always starting people to warm up with shifting squats and shifting lunges and isometrics and stuff uh, where you are engaging proactively. Again, remember, do not trust the exercise to adequately work the muscle for you. Don't make it passive, make it proactive. You want the muscle to engage and turn on and work, then make it work. Tell it to work you turn it on. And if you're like, well, if I get down into a squat and I don't feel my glutes turning on, just keep practicing. It's that simple. Practicing trying to engage and working the muscles in the bottom position, eventually you will get it. You will figure it out. It will start to develop and you will have that ability to engage it to a higher degree, which will totally transform everything about your lower body training. Uh, other things about uh, legs, uh, your hips is uh, hip sweeps. It's another good exercise that you can engage in, especially for your warm-ups. This is basically standing upright and you stick one leg out in front of you and then you swing the leg around you to the back and then back around. Works everything about your hips that you need. Strength, stability, mobility. You can, if you want to reduce the stability component, put your hand on the wall or hold on to something like a gymnastics ring. And that way it's not as much of a stability challenge and you can work on the strength to a much higher degree. But uh, that's a very good hip exercise that I warm up with uh, people up with all the time. Uh, and uh, yeah, hip hip strength and mobility will change your life. Crystal Ball is asking the question. We're all asking, Matt, what's the best mass building exercise for legs with calisthenics? It's whatever is going to give you the easiest way to adequately challenge the work capacity of your muscles. 
So when we're trying to build muscle, again, okay, exercise isn't the whole picture. We've also got to have genetics. We also got to have a lot of good food and rest and motivation and consistency and muscle activation and stability and mobility and on and on and on and on and on and on and on. So there's a lot more. You could have everything perfect about your workout and still never put on an ounce. But when it comes to the exercise, you want something that really allows you to work your muscles extremely hard with as little effort as possible. So for that, in my money, it, that's the exercises that I was talking about earlier of the hamstring curls and the sissy squats, just because it's really easy on a technical level. A lot of people have trouble building up their legs adequately with compound movements. Again, because they lack the stability and the mobility and the hip control and all those other things. And that even goes for, you know, free weights and stuff like that. You know, gosh, the number of times people have been in the gym, they're like, I'm squatting all this weight. I can't build my legs up for anything. It's like, it's really hard with compound stuff. But sit down on a leg extension machine and watch your quads grow overnight. Because the simpler the exercise is, the easier it is to challenge the work capacity of that muscle. So if you were like, I just want to build my legs up like crazy, I'd be like, all right, we're going to focus on sissies. We're going to focus on hamstring curls. And we're going to get some calf raises, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. And then we're going to use the compound stuff as a finisher. And in which case with that, I'm probably going to just go with simple lunge variations. Lunges are probably one of the best exercises we can ever do for our legs. And I'll save that for another episode exactly why. But in my humble opinion, most people are just better off with some sort of a light lunge variation. Just because of its simplicity and the ease of which we can do for being able to really, really push that muscular work capacity. Zen is coming back on. I overcoming isometric legs. How many sets? How long tension for increasing strength rate of force development? So you got to keep it short. Get as, you know, me if, with my adaptive training, get as many sets as you can before you start losing your energy. But uh, for force production, you want to keep it short and you want to make those muscles scream bloody murder. So you probably stick with the classic isometric standard of holding for six seconds and do it as much as you can until you start losing the juice. You know, as hard as you can, as long as you can. But once you start to fatigue, you're done. And then you move on. Because some days you're going to have more, some days you're going to have less. Joseph Bell, it's good to see you. Give me the updates, man. How's your training coming along? Just finished my full body workout. I work my legs with a 25 pound dumbbell, right? I've seen the videos. For some reason, when I uh, body weight exercise, I feel more muscle engagement. I keep the same pace when I both. Oh, let me. Do, do, do. Just uh, uh, weights, uh, excuse me, lunges across the room. I'm going to want to progress my leg workout, you work just taking about progressing lunges. Sorry, I'm a little, little uh, haphazard over here. I got like a thunderstorm literally brewing behind me here. It's distracting me a little bit. Um, so here's what I would recommend, Joseph, is make sure you're warming up with your body weight stuff and that engagement. And remember, whenever we have weight with our calisthenics training, loaded calisthenics, the whole point of adding weight is to basically challenge our ability to do the exercise. So if I can do, you know, pull-ups here on my pull-up bar and I'm like, okay, I got 10 reps, big range of motion, chest to the bar, feeling it in the lats. Okay. Then I put on my Kensui weight vest and I'm like, I got 30 pounds on it. Now I'm literally, I'm not saying, oh, I'm going to get stronger because I got 30 pounds on. No, that's not going to make me stronger. What does make me stronger is can I still get my chest to the bar in spite of having the 30 pounds on me? That's what makes you stronger when you're adding weight. So when it comes to your squats and your lunges with that 25 pound dumbbell, try to make it exactly the same with the weight as you would with the body weight training. And then if there's a discrepancy, work on minimizing and shrinking down that discrepancy. And that's what's going to get you stronger. It's a good rule of thumb, my friends, is when we have an erosion in our ability to do an exercise due to fatigue or strength or whatnot, excuse me, my stomach is still <clears throat> not doing so well these days, pardon, uh, is use whatever that does, whatever's changing. Is your range of motion different? Is your muscle activation different? Is your stability different? What is that thing that's changing? Fight against that change. And that goes for all muscle groups, not just the legs. Christopher saying, hey Matt, are unassisted pistol squats 
skill-based and uh, quote, if I want to build strength, would an assisted pistol be better? Should I forget about unassisted pistol squats of strength is my goal. It depends on you. So always remember, as I was saying earlier, like the standards of repetitions and stuff. I don't give a damn about standards. I don't give a damn about what someone says is the best way or this way and stuff. It's always based on your ability. So if you came to me over at Capra and we're starting to train together and you're like, yeah, here's my pistol squat and you squat down and you're all wibbling and wobbling and your hips are all over the place and you're doing the Jack Sparrow arms all over the place kind of thing. I'm like, yeah, okay, you're doing assisted pistol squats because you don't have the stability and the mobility to adequately challenge your muscular work capacity in your lower body. You're not just there yet. But if you start doing pistol squats and you're like making it look easy practically and you're like up, down, up, down, like a machine, like you've got Terminator legs, then yeah, I don't see any reason to add some assistance to that. Why? You know, we could do it maybe as a warm up or a drop set, or maybe you're having an off day or whatnot. But if you don't need it to adequately challenge your work capacity, no sense in having it. <clears throat> I get this question more often. I should be addressing this. Nellie's, what about prison cell half reps for dips and pull-ups uh, are truly better for hypertrophy than full range of motion? Nope. Uh, so again, we're looking at muscular work capacity. The actual exercise you do is less important. How you do it is less important. It's just muscles only know two things. They know time and they know tension. That's it. They don't know range. They don't know stability. They don't know the difference between a pull up and a pull down and all these other sorts of things. They just know how much tension are you putting into me and how long is it there for? That's all your muscles ever know. And when it comes especially to muscular conditioning, particularly for building muscle, that's all you're working with. We got all these things. We got range of motion. We got sets. We got reps. We got drop sets. We got this and that. It all boils down to those two things, time and tension. And that's all your muscles ever know. So whether or not you're doing full range or half rep or whatever, it's just time and tension. If the time and tension is the same, the results are going to be the same. So don't look for ways to try to you know, find a, a better way around things. Just simply say, what's going to allow me to get much more tension in the muscle for a lot longer period of time? And for my money, that's going to be bigger range. Why? Just because it's freaking harder. You know, it's just harder to do that. And you can also have the mobility benefits and control benefits and all those other sorts of things. But that doesn't mean half reps are bad because, again, it's just the same thing. If you've got 30 seconds of time under tension and the tension's roughly the same, you're going to get the same result either way. <clears throat> Joseph's following up saying, Matt, do um no, no, no. want to progress my leg work. We work on just talking about progressing lunges. Uh, that'll be something for another time, possibly. But lunges, I love lunges simply because they require everything in a fairly balanced way. You know, with pistol squats, a lot of people are limited by mobility and stability, so they can't adequately challenge their legs enough with a pistol. Or they're doing other exercises where uh, their mobility and stability is challenged, but their uh, strength isn't really that challenged and so on. Lunges seem to have this really good balance to them where the strength is really challenged, the endurance is really challenged, the stability and the mobility is really challenged. One of the things to keep in mind with everything that we're working on, though, is the uh, easiest way to think of compound squat chain movements is just put your butt on your heels. You know, you got your heel, you got your heel, your hips, and you just bring the two together. So when you're doing your lunges, how close can you get your hip to your heel or ass to ankle, as I like to say? Forget ass to grass, ass to ankle. How close can you get those two together? That's usually the best place to start progressing lunges for most people because they're not going nearly as deep as they think they can. <laughs> Cristobal is asking, hey, Matt, on explosive training, which is more effective to get more power on explosives, high pull-ups or the muscle-ups? Well, we could argue the muscle-up just because you're getting higher with it, but it's not about the exercise. It's just about what can you have more power focus on. So if you're getting a lot of power, if you're really adequately challenging your power, how are you, you do it on ropes? You need to do it with, uh, you know, seated pull-ups if you want. You know, just all you got to do is challenge your power and explosiveness 
And you can probably do that with that almost any pull chain exercise. So I would say, don't worry about the exercise, focus more on just how much power you can put into uh, which, which exercise allows you to focus on doing uh, a lot of the power. Computer Geek, thank you very much for the tip. First time catching a live. New seven, I love the content on YouTube and Amazon. Thank you very much. Sincerely appreciate that. Thanks for the coffee. Or if I'm honest with you, probably go out and buy a beer later tonight. But I do sincerely appreciate that. <clears throat> Sean saying, uh, do you like suspension curls better than Nordic curls? Absolutely. Nordic curls worth doing. I would say for most people, no. Uh, I don't like Nordic curls uh, simply because of the reasons that I expressed earlier, where it's like the suspension ones are just, they're easier to do. They're easier to progress. They're easier to regress. They work the entire uh, posterior chain. They're really easy to uh, uh, increase your range of motion. And the, most of the time, I mean, let's be honest, the Nordic curl is something where it's like people you know, come down about 15 degrees and then they lose it and they collapse onto the floor and then they push themselves back up. And it's like the guy back in the day who used to do bench presses, who was like, I have to be able to bench press my own body weight. And he'd always have me spot him and he couldn't handle the weight. He'd unrack it. And then he would basically do a very dangerous, haphazard, eccentric, you know, try to prevent the bar from crushing him. And then I'd have to basically body weight row it off of his chest. I'm like, dude, what? this is not doing anything for you. Nordic curls, they're just not appropriate for most people. I, and I think you're just going to get a lot more from the hamstring suspension curls. That's why I use them. Spicy J, I've been, I've heard that having your feet flat on the ground, uh, lower leg being a pillar that won't falter is extremely important when squats. Can you add a bit more to that? What do you think? Your lower leg should move for sure. Anything that is locked in place is going to hold you back with most types of training, unless you need it for safety reasons, like, you know, keeping a straight back during a deadlift, that sort of thing. But for the most part, the more movement you can get everywhere in your body, the better. Uh, when it comes to your squats and stuff. So that's why when, you know, squatting and lunging and stuff, like get that knee as far forward as you can, as far forward, but keep your heel down. That's going to give you that ankle mobility. And that's going to be really good for the hips as well. <laughs> Sean is saying, scissor squats made my quads feel like they want to peel from the tension. Yes, never had that engagement before. Um, Find it also work my lower back and core as well. Careful of the lower back though there, Sean. Uh, we don't want to feel the lower back. That's like a joint. Uh, make sure that your glute activation is keeping that neutral pelvic tilt. If you're getting an uh, anterior pelvic tilt and you're pinching your lumbar, could be a sign that you need a little bit more posterior pelvic tilt. But yeah, that's uh, sissy squats for the win, man. In all honesty, like sometimes when I'm working out on my own, and stuff, I'll be like, if I'm going to hit my legs, I'm doing sissy squats. I'm not doing lunges. I'm not doing pistols. I'm not jumping. I'm, I'm hitting the sissy squats just because they're so unbelievably satisfying. Let's help Ryan K here with the plateau. I've hit my first plateau with the isomax, struggling to get my chest press up. Any advice? Try different heights. You know, that's one of the first things that you can do uh, with that. Also, time durations as well. So are you using it on load mode or time mode? But if you're used to using short durations, try long durations. If you're using longer durations, use short durations. Um, maybe even go with just flat out max, uh, trying to, to max things out. So for example, if you're doing your chest press and you're at 200 pounds, let's say, just arbitrarily, and you want to get to 220, then set the load for 220 pounds and just keep trying until you can get one beep, which would tell you that you got 220 pounds, right? So you could do that too. The beautiful thing about the Isomax is that there are so many ways you can use it for different workout types and styles. So I would use different types and styles that uh, you're either going for max strength or longer duration, or if you're using load mode, use time mode. If you're using time mode, use load mode. You know, all those sorts of ways to vary it up a little bit will change your mental perception of what you're doing, and that's going to help you break out of the plateau. <clears throat> Alex A saying, hey, Matt, have you ever trained on a Cobra bag or speed bag? Not a whole lot, no. Uh, more, most of my stuff has always been like the good old-fashioned Muay Thai bags. When I, uh, uh, I did the proverbial move back into the parents' basement when I started uh, 
to be a fitness coach over 20 years ago and you know broke as a joke and everything and one of the first things i did was i hung a big you know banana bag up in the basement and probably drove my parents half crazy with it and stuff but i've always liked uh, things that just give me a big range of areas to hit sort of thing so that's that's what i've got more experience with <laughs> zen's coming back on which muscle position is better for max length max strength and overcoming isometrics shortest or longest both train both uh throughout you know, you don't have to do the same in this the same workout you just uh you know spend several weeks at one length several weeks at the other and stuff it's one of the great things about uh, isometrics is that it gives you that freedom and flexibility Alex Sen saying, uh, hey, Matt, does doing glute bridge with a neutral pelvic tilt make the exercise more effective? Most of the advice I need is to do it with a posterior tilt, which I have pain in. Is it a posterior tilt or is it an anterior tilt? Where's the pain? Uh, so a posterior tilt, yeah, because then you're getting your max range. But neutral is fine. Neutral is perfectly fine. In fact, the, the difference with a glute bridge is you're going to have um, just a few degrees of rotation. Uh, and it's also depends on if you're trying to stretch and mobilize the hip flexors in the front as well. But neutral is okay. You you certainly can do that. Spicy J is saying a lot of questions tonight. Glad to see you all. Yeah, I agree, folks. Uh, I usually, again, do these on Saturdays, but uh, good to see everyone here on the Sunday. And I'm going to be doing episodes for this over the next few weeks on the other areas of the body, too. Today, we're covering legs. And next week, we'll be back in buys or chest and tries, depending on if I can remember which one I do. And then the next week will be chest and tries, and then we'll probably do a core training one after that. So make sure you're checking in on these. The audios will be reposted on the podcast directory of your choice. They'll be on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel. So make sure you check on that, subscribe, all that sort of thing, because we're going to be covering a lot of really good stuff. <clears throat> Sovereign Brother saying, where does a beginner start with? When you can't do one of anything, one of the books uh, speaks to which of your books speaks to a beginner. I never train beginners because I've never met a beginner. Everybody's got different levels of ability. That's the number one rule that you follow as a coach is you never train someone as a beginner or an expert or an intermediate or someone who's older or younger. You always train according to someone's capability. I don't care if you've got 30 years of experience or 30 minutes of experience. I'm not going to train you according to that. I'm going to train you according to what you can do. What is your level of ability? And so all of my books will cover everything, no matter what level of ability you're bringing to. Progressive and weighted calisthenics, grind style calisthenics. I've got some exercises in there that are so easy that people criticize me for. And you're like, really, dude? You think there are people out there who are actually going to be adequately work with this type of exercise? I'm like, yes, there are people who need you know, uh, suspension, body weight squats, or even half body weight squats. So no matter what level you're at, calisthenics can accommodate. Same with isometrics. Of course, that automatically accommodates you no matter what level you're at, even on a rep by rep basis or set by set basis. So everything's going to work to a very large degree. I usually tell people start with progressive weighted or my grind style calisthenics. Or if you have something in particular that you want to check out, like Suspension calisthenics is all about using rings or suspension straps because they're basically a portable weight machine that you can use. Um, isometrics, same thing, and so on. So beginners are relative, and it's always a little bit different too. Some people, I have to train them at a very low level for their legs, but they're at a very high level for pull-ups. You know, it happens all the time out here in Colorado. Rock climbing is a big thing. So all the time people come in and they're like, yeah, I'm a rock climber. I'm like, okay, you could probably do pull-ups for days, but you probably can't squat for crap. Assumption based, of course, but uh, that's the way you do it is you always base things off of your ability, your level of ability. You work with what you have. That's what I talk about in my latest quick read uh, on the Bible of adaptive training. When your training is adaptive, you're matching your training strategy to your abilities. And when you do that, you make your training adequate to be it effective without overdoing it. But it's also adjusting things so it's not too much stress on mind, body, and lifestyle. So it's all good stuff and less of the bad stuff. Again, that's over at reddeltaproject.com. Link is down below. <clears throat> Christopher saying, what do you think is the best for chest development, push-ups or dips? We'll cover that in the next couple of weeks. But the bottom line is both. A big fan of chest flies, though. 
really like chess flies. Alex Sandin saying, how do you brace properly? Are there more than one way to do it? The best way I ever learned, I'm assuming you're talking about in the core, is just have someone punch you in the gut. <laughs> Relatively, you know, hard, of course. You know, we used to do this all the time in Taekwondo, where you would just stand, brace, and hit yourself a little bit. And you're not trying to knock yourself out, but there's a lot that goes on with learning proper activation from hitting. If you check out Neuromass, the John Bruni classic text, he always would have people warm up with tempering the muscles, you know, because the natural reflexive activation of a muscle from impact is to tighten up. So if you're doing this, or you'll see sometimes power lifters before they do their lift, they'll have a you know, guy, you know, slapping their back and things like that. That's what's going on. So just standing, have, you know, some hitting. And that's a real good way to brace. Bonus points, if you could do it while breathing, you know, take deep breaths while you're talking and you're just kind of tempering like that, hitting different parts. And you're not trying to hurt yourself, but it's a real quick way to learn how to brace properly. Fukan, I do... Uh, sissy squats to my legs cramp, and then I superset with weighted pistol squats till failure. Damn, man, you got some strong legs. Try jumping pistol squats too. That'll be fun. <laughs> Keep calm. Let me help you. Saying, Matt, I have a question. Recently started working out, and my reps in my second and third set are drastically reduced. Yes. For example, I do 11 pull ups and two minute rest and six, four. Why? Because you're tired, man. It's that simple. It's that simple. So the more you push into the red zone, on how much work capacity you have, the more you're gonna have a decline. So if you're like 11, 11, 11, 11, that means you're not really pushing that hard in the first few sets. If you're really pushing hard in those first uh, set or two, you're gonna have that decline. And that's just always the way it is. So in Grind Style Calisthenics book, I talk about this backfilling strategy where you know you would take that those numbers, for example, where you'd have 11, I'm trying to say 11, six and four. So you'd write down, okay, I got 11, six and four. And then the next workout, you would do 11. And even if you could do more than 11, you don't, because then you do more than six or more than four. So you're backfilling the, the latter sets or the latter repetitions. You're essentially having like the energy that you're saving spill over into the next ones. But yeah, if you're really pushing pretty hard, you're always going to have that decline uh, just because you can push yourself that hard. But that's also a a good thing because a lot of people can't push themselves that hard. Uncle Fester, good to talk to you. Uh, saying I have I haven't trained my legs over a year now. I want to do loads of bodyweight squats. The Dom's is going to be insane, absolutely. So don't feel like you got to go 100 miles an hour, my friend. Take it easy. You literally just do a couple sets, you know, to get things moving. Work on technique. Work on range of motion. Or you could be like me and want that sort of thing. I'm like, I don't want to walk tomorrow kind of thing. Oh, I'm a masochist at heart, I swear. Oh, man. I started this thing out thinking I was maybe going to go for half an hour. It's already an hour and seven minutes. It's always good talking to you folks. Thank you so much for coming on, especially on your Sunday. It's very much appreciated. <clears throat> Beater geek, I haven't had a beer in over a year. Good for you, my friend. Good for you. Let's see if there's anything here. I hate to uh, cut and run here, folks, but uh, I've got a lot of <clears throat> a lot of other things on the fire here. One more thing from Dominic coming on. So Matt, I saw that you have a book about bodyweight training for cyclists. Yes. Does this also include how the ride should be programmed? No. When I see common plans, they work with 1% with a percent of maximum heart rate. No, it has nothing to do with the riding whatsoever uh, because you're already go gonna have that covered. You're already riding and stuff. It is purely about upgrading your engine. Uh, body weight training for cycling. It's one of the quickest books I have. It's not very big. It's almost a quick read. Very, very simple. And I write this because as a cyclist myself, one of the biggest mistakes that we often make in the endurance field is we don't do any neuromuscular strength and conditioning. I was just talking with a buddy out here uh, in Denver who's just getting into cycling. And I'm like, what's your strength and conditioning program like? And he's like, oh, what now? Because endurance uh, sports, particularly like cycling, require are very resource intensive. They take a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of energy. 
And then when some guy like me is like, oh, you need to be doing strength training. They're like, dude, I don't have it. I don't have the time and the energy and the money and the gym memberships and all that sort of thing. And that's why I wrote that book. It's like, literally, here's three exercises you should be doing. If you want more, here's five. If you want more, okay, here's a full body approach. It's all about making sure that you're not basically screwing yourself over by A, uh, putting a lot of power and potential strength left on the table. Because boy, if I had to do it again, and you better believe when I was racing for UVM, I would have done a lot more strength training and a lot less time on the bike, especially in the off season. But two is it, there's muscle imbalances. You know, people talk about how uh, strength training can make you tight and imbalanced and everything. It's like you think strength training will. Cardio is even much worse, especially cycling. Uh, in many ways, cycling is very unhealthy for a lot of things like kyphotic posture and things like that. So that book is all about addressing those issues. As far as uh, the riding goes, get on your bike and ride up something heavy, <laughs> ride up something that's really steep. So, okay, my friends, I will bid you adieu. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming on on your Sunday, asking me questions. Remember, I've got the uh, episodes coming out next week and the week after that. Hopefully, I don't think I've got too much going on on future Saturdays, but I promise I'll have it coming out at some point. So make sure you're on the RDP Instagram channel for updates to that. And we'll be talking back and buys, just in tries and core and subsequent episodes. So make sure you're subscribed and following along and all that sort of thing. Again, all the resources I've been talking about, all of my books, all of my quick reads. Uh, I've got new book and quick read bundles over at reddeltaproject.com. So you get all these PDFs that are all collectively about things like beginning and calisthenics and stuff that help you uh, get a good amount of information in one uh, package and it helps save some money as well. But anyway, check out everything over at reddeltaproject.com. I will folks talk to you later. <laughs> Until then, be fit and live free.